Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come here and, and uh, discuss this paper at this conference. Uh, now, of course, to the point where I have to sing for my supper. Um, for your own benefit, I'm not actually going to sing, but I will uh, at least try and base off the title some, some, some of my comments. Um, usual disclaimer applies. These are definitely my own views today. Uh, the, the paper, as Stainless has gone through very well, it, it looks at the impact of floods in Wallonia. Um, now, this has become an increasingly important topic in Europe. The, we had the 2021 floods in, in Wallonia and Germany. Um, we had 2022 floods in Italy, the 2023 floods in Slovenia, the 2024 floods in Central Europe and Northern Italy again. Um, it, talking about disasters, there's always some recent event that you, somewhere worldwide that you used to be able to hang you know, as a motivation for your talk. Um, in Europe now, it's increasingly that there's always a local event in Europe that's a big, big damage. Um, so when you describe this as a one in a hundred year event, uh, I, I get a kind of bit of Kiwi comes over me. I say, yeah, nah. It may have been 100 years in the past. This is definitely going to be more frequent than 100 year in the future. Um, the, the damage is widespread, uh, as, as noted, affecting 10 communes um, severely. Uh, estimates of damage, 10 billion, but actually in Germany, there was 40 billion, those floods. Um, and these are significant economic impacts. Uh, the Slovenia floods of last year estimated damages of 16% of GDP. These are not small events. Um, in terms of the data, really, really, uh, I mean, uh, as everyone here probably knows, the, the NVB firm level data is absolutely amazing, and everyone else is really jealous of it. So I'm, I'm glad I can come here and slava of your, your wonderful data in this, um, in this, present, in this discussion. Now, the, the early findings from this paper are uh, a really substantial impact. 15% reduction in sales is, is, is economically meaningful and significant. Um, as the authors mentioned, uh, this is the style of the process. They've already got some really great results and, and we've mentioned some stuff we plan to go through. So um, today I'm going to go through some ideas of, of maybe where you can take this paper and some stuff to add. Um, and in fact, in truth, probably the next three papers too. Um, uh, let me start with a real bugbear of mine. Uh, you describe this as a natural disaster. Disasters are not natural. And this is a really important point when thinking about it. All right? There's an underlying natural hazard. In this case, it rained too much. But even here, even here, we're starting to see impacts, right? Attribution studies for, uh, early attribution studies for Helen of last week and the uh, Central European floods find that the rainfall was increased by up to 50% by man-made climate change. So even the natural hazard is no longer natural. But even taking that hazard as given, it's only when it as exposure to economic activity that we start to see impacts. A hurricane in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean has no impact, right? It's exposure, and then having been exposed, it's how much that adaptation and resilience we have um, against these things. And only once you have economic activity that's exposed to this hazard and that, that overcomes the resilience adaptation, we have what we call a disaster. But how much resilience adaptation we put in place is a choice that we make. Where to cite economic activity is also a choice. Whether we choose to burn fossil fuels and make the natural hazard bigger in the future is also a choice. And that becomes important because when you call something a natural disaster, it's very easy to go, ah, it's natural, nothing we could have done about it, now we just have to cope with it, right? But when we come to think about policy, we have policy levers that do affect these outcomes and decide what we get to choose to call it disasters. Um, and I'll get to some policy recommendations, at least ways that this paper can maybe hopefully come to some policy recommendations. But let me talk really about supply chain impacts. Um, the really interesting thing is indeed this, this ability to look at the supply chain. And the findings of the paper is that it's mostly upstream impacts. Although, just a comment in terms of readability, when your paper is about the impact of riverine floods, upstream and downstream have also <laughs> different implications too. Um, so I think that's very interesting, um, and I'm really glad that, that they have started working on, on, on this topic. Um, it's particularly interesting that there's not much difference between upstream and downstream. Um, your idea here is what, if I understand from Poulton's talk, is a snake here, right? That we have one long chain. But, but maybe think about if I have a firm which has one upstream supplier impacted, does that impact non-affected upstream suppliers too? To look at. Um, you talk about looking at 
uh, sectors a bit, I'd be interested to see difference in intermediate and final goods and services, whether that, that affects there too, that sector. Um, in terms of model, you, you, you talk about making a model, maybe a theoretical model. There's one from Henriette Halliat Taburi in 2012 that look at the impact of disasters on the supply chain network. It's a theoretical model. Um, and they identify two things that kind of matter. They call it concentration and clustering, right? So concentration is how concentrated are your suppliers, right? If you have lots and lots of suppliers and one gets damaged but you have others, then, then you maybe have some resilience. Clustering is a regional thing where there's a, a bunch of firms that supply and, and purchase from each other within a region. Um, and that means that when that region gets struck, the impact is much greater. But actually for the rest of the economy, the impact's lesser because uh, it's, it's very much concentrated in one area. And the risk of having lots of different suppliers are that basically any supply chain disruption anywhere else in the world affects you. So there are trade-offs to be made here, not just with about spreading out the supply chain wider, but whether um, you know, having regional isolates you from, from these shocks. Now, I promised some policy stuff. So first of all, financial stability implications. You, you look at probability of exit. I think it can be really good to dig more great, deeper into what causes these exits. Um, is there balance sheet information we can tell about? Uh, Leiter, Oberhof, and Raschke look at the impact of floods, uh, in European floods, uh, and they argue for creative destruction, that actually um, the least productive firms tend to go out of business. Um, they also find a role for assets, so firms of greater share of intangibles seem to survive better. Not really a surprise, if the tangibles get affected. Um, cash might matter, inventories might matter. So I think these are balance sheet information that might be useful uh, to, to look at. Um, and then, but even then they find that productivity is lower off the event. So management, even if your firm survives, gets distracted. So I think looking at productivity, profitability after the event. Um, fiscal policy. Now, the Wallonian local government apparently did provide aid to the regions. Um, and the literature generally finds that fiscal support is quite important for post-disaster recovery. Um, it would be great if you had anything to say on this about any of the instruments they used. Were there some areas that were effective, were not? Um, did their prioritization of the category one, two, three regions seem appropriate ex post based on, on, firm, on firm data? Um, I think given that we're moving to a world of, of greater disasters, being able to say which policy interventions work and which don't, I think is very useful. On that subject, there's a banking working paper coming out in a couple of weeks' time by Fikara Mari that look at the regional impact of floods in the UK. Um, and they find that local government adaptation spending um, is very important. It reduces the probability of a flood happening. Um, I've no idea what data you have here or the, what the local government may be to provide you, but I think that would be interesting to see whether this adaptation spending, again, this is one of my pillars, that by having resilience in place, you don't get a disaster. Um, for those areas that did disaster, the paper finds that actually has little impact, difference in impact. Um, timing also matters. Uh, looking at other disasters, prompt payments are really vital. When the disaster hits, that's when people need the money. And if you delay payments for six months, a year, often it's no different than actually having no payment at all. Um, but just to note, fiscal policy was available this time. It might not be forever, right? And we have a terrible situation in Europe at the moment where we basically rely on fiscal policy to do this, right? There's terrible, massive moral hazard where customers, right, where households do not insure themselves because they think they can be bailed out. Now, as we can have more and more disasters, the question is going to be about whether fiscal policy can afford this in the future. Um, and that's why, just as a note, we've done a lot of work on, on the insurance protection gap at the ECB, thinking about how we can actually encourage insurance. Um, only a quarter of climate-related disasters are currently insured in Europe. Um, and what we need to do is think about how we can raise that. But we also, in the context of the climate crisis, need to think about more difficult questions, questions that make us feel uncomfortable, make us squirm. Things like, do we need manage retreat? Are there some areas which are now exposed so much that actually it's no longer viable to have economic activity there? And even if we've been there for, for centuries, we need to start moving away and, and moving away from them. Um, another thing to look at is maybe bank lending data and the credit. Um, I'd be really interested to see what happened to lending to the firms affected here and, and how much that affected their performance afterwards. Um, final policy, 
of course. My, my job policy. What should my job policy do after these events? Um, it's very, very tip. Well, first of all, what's the impact on CPI? Um, I don't know what prices information you have your database, but this will be, I think, very useful. There is only one paper in the literature that looks at the impact of floods on CPI. Um, it finds that there's a short-term increase in food prices, but the core CPI is lower, right? So when we use this, uh, if I had a euro every time I went to a conference and someone said, you can think of that as a, as a supply shock, I'd be very rich, but none the wiser, because I don't think it's a true characterization. There's a mix of supply shocks and negative demand shocks, right? We have uncertainty, we have the disruption to supply chain very well made out by this paper. Um, and that means it's not necessarily clear what's going to happen to policy. And I think in terms of upcoming strategy view, that's really important to think about. Um, the chart on the right is it was also from this Vicar and Mari paper coming out that shows wholesale retail trade prices are lower after, after a couple of years, in fact, from flooding events. Um, the paper finds other directions for other, other, other prices. Um, and my, my final point, I promised questions that make us squirm and wriggle and make our skin crawl. And this is one that really makes me do that after 20 years at central banks, which is, do we as central banks need to do more than just react to the price impacts of, of disasters? Um, do we need to think about more proactive policy? Do we have things like tiered rates for lending to encourage green investment for adaptation and for mitigation? Um, clearly, it's not a very popular topic. It's something we try and avoid talking about. But we have recently a financial crisis. And there, the ECB, ESCB, in fact, did introduce policies to help support the financial crisis and financial stability. Um, and we were taken to court over it. So let me read to you a, a quote from the ECJ judgment on one of those court cases. Transmission of the ESCB's monetary policy measures to price trends takes place via inter alia, facilitation of the supply of credit to the economy, and modification of the behavior of businesses and individuals with regard to investment, consumption, and saving. The conclusions of those court cases are that ECB can act directly for price stability, and it can act indirectly to put in place the pre to foster the preconditions that are necessary for price stability. We know that financial stability is a necessary, price, necessary precondition. We have custom practice and jurisprudence that the ECB can and should act to foster financial stability in order to meet its price stability goal. What this paper and the bunch of other literature we have now on the impacts of climate on prices, on outputs, our studs show that climate stability is also a precondition. Thank you again for the paper. I look forward to the next session.